Viticulture is a game of winemaking set in pre-modern Tuscany. You've inherited a small vineyard, and it's up to you to begin growing grapes and making wine so that you can become a well-known exporter of fine wines. But all the other players are trying to do the same thing, so the race is on. As with most Stonemaier games titles, this game comes with a single-player variant against an opponent known as the Automa. Automa... Automa... I don't know, I've heard it pronounced different ways. I'm going to stick with Automa. I won't be covering the Automa rules in this video, but if you want me to cover them in the future, let me know in the comments. During the game, you'll go through the seasons of the year with each one offering different things you can do. It's a worker placement game, but you only have a small number of workers and you have to divide them between taking summer and winter actions, so there's a lot of balancing you need to do. In the spring, players will decide the order in which everyone will take their turns for the year. During the summer, players will use their workers to take the yellow summer actions. This is where you can do things like building new structures and planting new vines. In the fall, players will get to choose a summer or winter visitor card, which will give them small bonuses when they play them. And in the winter, players will use all the workers they didn't use in the summer to take the blue winter actions. These are things like harvesting grapes, making wine, and filling wine orders for points. Once somebody reaches 20 points, the rest of the year is played out, and then the game is over. In the box, you get one double-sided game board. One side has everything printed in English, and the other side is in Italian, for greater immersion. There are six smaller player boards. These are also double-sided. Wooden meeples in six different colors. Additional wooden meeples for general use. Glass grape tokens. Four decks of small cards, these are the vine cards, the summer visitor cards, the wine order cards, and the winter visitor cards. Three decks of standard size cards, these are the mama and papa cards, and the field cards. An additional automa deck for the single player version. Cardboard coins in denominations of 5, 2, and 1. A rule book and a reference sheet. To set up the game, place the game board in the middle of the table. Next, place the gray worker token on the space next to the seven, and put the grape and coin tokens where everyone can reach them. Put all of the small card decks on the spaces matching their colors. The blank spaces next to them will be where the discard piles go. Give each player a player board and the matching colored meeples. Then give each player one each of the five, six, and seven value field cards, and place them with the sold sign down at the top of the player board covering the matching numbers. Each player should put their wine bottle meeple in the center of the residual payment tracker and their cork meeple on the start space on the victory point track. Next, shuffle the mama and papa cards and deal one of each to each player. These determine what you start the game with. The mama card will give you two regular sized workers and in most cases, three small cards. Take your two workers and place them on the available workers space on your player board. Then take the cards that match the colors on your mama card. These are your personal hand of cards. You can look at them, but keep them face down so the other players don't see them. If the mama card gives you coins, take those too. Your papa card will generally give you your grande worker, some coins, and then the choice of either more coins or a building. Take all the stuff on the top and then choose one of the two on the bottom. If you choose to start with the building, put the matching building meeple on your player board near the printed icon. The cottage and cellar icons look very similar, so to avoid confusion, I'll show you the difference now. The medium cellar has a small door in the center, and the large cellar has a large door in the center. The cottage also has a small door, but it's off to one side, and the cottage is also a little taller than the cellars. So this is a medium cellar, and this is a cottage. You won't need the mama and papa cards anymore, so you can put them all back in the box to keep them out of the way. Lastly, determine who will go first, and give them the wooden grape token. The game is played in seasons, with different actions that can be taken during each one. There is a banner printed on the right side of the game board with all the actions to take during each season, so use this if you forget what you're supposed to do. The game starts in the spring. During the spring, all you have to do is determine the turn order for the year, known as the wake-up order. Beginning with the player that has the grape token, and continuing clockwise, each player will put their rooster token on one of the spaces on the turn order track. The lower the number you choose, the earlier you will take your turn. 
but you also get to take the benefit next to your number. So depending on what you need, you might want to go a little later. Number one always goes first, but there's no additional benefit. Number two allows you to draw a green vine card. Number three lets you draw a purple wine order card. Number four gives you one lira, or coin. Number five lets you draw either a summer or winter visitor card. Number six gives you a point. And number seven allows you to take the gray seasonal worker token to use during this year. Once everyone has chosen their number, you move on to the summer and play passes in the order that everyone wakes up. Now, before I jump into all the actions that you can do, I'm gonna cover two things. First is the ox cart space. This space can be taken by any number of workers during either the summer or the winter. When you take this action, you get one coin. The second is the number of spaces available on each action. As shown on the season banner, a different number of spaces is available on each action depending on the number of players. If you have two players, only the opaque space is available, which means that only one player can take each action. If you have three or four players, the second space becomes available, which also gives a bonus when you take it. If there's five or six players, all three spaces become available. If the bonus is available, you can take it even if you're the first player to take that action. You can't take an action just to gain the bonus though. So for example, if you don't have any grapes or fields to sell, you can't take the sell action just to gain the point. However, if you can't gain the bonus, you can still take the bonus space to block other players from getting it. For example, if you only have one vine card, you can take the middle space on the plant a vine card action, which would allow you to plant two vines. Since you only have one to plant, you don't gain the benefit of taking the middle space, but someone else may have wanted to take that bonus, and now it's blocked. When taking an action, place one of the workers you have in your available worker space on your player board, and take the action allowed. What do the actions do, you ask? Let's talk about different action spaces. The Play a Summer Visitor card action allows you to play a yellow card from your hand. The bonus allows you to play a second yellow card on the same turn. When you take this action, discard your card and follow the instructions printed on it. The Draw a Vine card action allows you to draw a green vine card. The bonus lets you draw two. The Sell Grape Tokens or Buy Slash Sell One Field action lets you do one of two things. You can sell one or more grape tokens from your crush pad for the number of coins printed beside the grape's value. So for instance, if you have a value 3 red grape, which is worth 1 coin, and a value 5 white grape, which is worth 2 coins, you can sell both for a total of 3 coins. You don't have to sell all of your grapes, you can sell as many or as few as you like. The other option is to buy or sell one field. To sell one of your fields, the field must already be empty. Flip the card to the sold side and take the number of coins printed on the card. To buy back a field, you simply pay that number of coins and flip the field back over. Taking the bonus space also gives you one victory point. The build one structure action lets you build any of your remaining structures for the cost printed on your player board. The bonus gives you a one coin discount. You have the option to build a yoke for two coins, a trellis for two coins, a water tower for three coins, a cottage for four coins, a windmill for five coins, a tasting room for six coins, a medium cellar for four coins, and a large cellar for six coins. These can be built in any order except for your medium and large cellars. You can't build the large cellar until you have the medium one. The yoke acts as an action space that only you can use. You can only take the action once per year, but you can take it in either the summer or the winter. If you take this action, you can uproot one of your vine cards and put it back in your hand, or you can harvest grapes from one of your fields. I'll explain how the rest of the buildings work throughout the rest of the video. The give a tour action allows you to take two coins. The bonus space gives you a third coin. If you have a tasting room and you have wine in your cellar, you also gain one victory point when you take this action. You can only gain one point per year this way. The plant a vine card action lets you plant one vine card on your fields. The bonus space allows you to plant a second vine card. 
By the way, a quick disclaimer for all of you wine aficionados out there. I don't know much about wine, so if I butcher the name of your favorite grape, I'm sorry. Okay, back to the video. Each vine card has a value, which is determined by adding the numbers on all the grapes on the card together. So the Pinot card has a value of 2 since it has a white grape worth 1 and a red grape worth 1. The Merlot card has a value of 3 since it has a red grape worth 3. The combined value of the cards you plant cannot exceed the maximum value of the field you're planting it on. So you could plant both the Pinot and the Merlot on the max 5 field, but you can't plant a Pinot and a Chardonnay together as the combined value is 6. To do that, you'd have to use one of the other two fields. If the card has a picture of a trellis or irrigation on it, you need to have that structure in order to plant the vine. Some of them have both, in which case you need both structures. If you have a windmill, you get a point when you plant a vine card. Like the tasting room, you can only gain one point per year from the windmill. That's all the summer actions. Remember, you only start with three available workers, and you don't get any of them back until the end of the winter. So if you want to take any winter actions, you should pass before using all three. Once everyone has played all their workers or has passed, the summer is over. During the fall, everyone should draw either a summer or winter visitor card. Do this in the wake-up order. If you have a cottage, you can take two cards, either two of the same or one of each. Now it's time for winter. If you have any workers remaining, you may use them to take any of the winter actions. The same rules apply for numbers of players and bonuses as in the summer. The play a winter visitor card action allows you to play a blue card from your hand. Discard the card and follow the instructions. The bonus lets you play two blue cards. The draw a wine order card action lets you draw a purple card. The bonus lets you draw two. The harvest one field action lets you harvest all the grapes from one of your fields. The bonus lets you harvest a second field. When you do this, combine the value of all the same colored grapes on the field together and place a grape token on that number and color on your crush pad. You do have to combine the value. So for example, if you have a Sangiovese, a Syrah, and a Merlot all planted on the same field, you're not allowed to take three different valued red grapes. You have to take one value six red grape, which means the most you can ever harvest from one field is two grapes, one red and one white. If you already have a grape of the value you just harvested, you have to devalue your grape until you can fit it on your crush pad. If it goes all the way down to zero, you lose that grape token. Each field can only be harvested once per year, even if you did it using the yoke during the summer. The make up to two wine tokens action lets you turn your grape tokens into wine tokens. The bonus space lets you create a third wine token. You can either take a red or white grape and make it into red or white wine of the same value, or you can combine grapes to make blush or sparkling wine. When you combine grapes, you add the values together to create the new wine's value. There's a table you can use to remember which grapes you need to make which wine. One red and one white create a blush, and two red and one white make a sparkling wine. Since you're combining multiple tokens into a single wine, discard the excess tokens. There's two things you're not allowed to do when combining tokens. First, you can never combine only red or only white tokens to make higher value red or white wines. And second, wine tokens can never be combined to make blush or sparkling wine. Only grapes can be combined. When you're making wine, you can never make wine that exceeds the max value that your current seller can hold. You start the game with a small seller. When you have a small seller, you can only hold red and white wine, and they can't be worth more than a value of three. If you turn a grape token worth four or more into wine, you have to devalue it down to three. Once you have your medium seller, you can hold up to a value of six, and you can also hold blush wine. Again, any wine that you make that's worth more than a value of six has to be devalued. The large seller expands your max value to nine, and you can now hold sparkling wine. Wine tokens can never go above a value of nine. The train a worker action lets you pay four coins to train a new worker. 
the bonus space gives you a one coin discount. When you take this action, pay the cost and then take one of the workers from your pile of meeples and lay it down on the board. When the winter is over, you can collect your new worker and put them on the available worker space on your player board. The fill a wine order action lets you play a wine order card. When you do this, you must have the type and value of the wine on the card in your cellar. Discard the card and the wine tokens, and then take the number of points on the card. The bonus space gives you one additional point. These cards also have a symbol of a coin with two revolving arrows. If it's a one, move your wine bottle up one space on the residual payment tracker. And if it's a two, move it up two spaces. Your residual payments can never go higher than five. Also, if you have a wine token of the type you need, but it's a higher value, you can use it to fill the wine order. But if it's a lower value, you can't. You can never use a wine of the wrong type to fill a wine order. That's it for the winter actions. Now I think it's time that we address the elephant in the room. Well, maybe elephant is too strong a word. How about hippopotamus? That's right, I'm talking about the grande worker. The grande worker is bigger than the other workers because he needs to be able to muscle his way in when there's no room. If all the spaces on an action are full, the grande worker can still play there. Just place him nearby and take the action as normal. If you use the grande worker before the spaces are full, he does take up the space as usual, meaning smaller workers can't get in there if it's full. And there's no limit to the number of grande workers that can be played on any action. Remember, if you already used your grande worker and you can't take any other actions, you can always take the ox card action. Keep playing until the last of the workers are used. After that, the winter is over. Now there's a few more things to do before the year's over, and they're all listed on the season banner. First, age up your grape and wine tokens. Each grape and wine token you have goes up in value by one. Tokens can't age up past nine, and you can only have one of each value and color so it stops the whole line if they're already at the top. I like to call this the Jungle Book effect. Your tokens also can't age up past your seller's max holding value. Your grapes, however, can age all the way up to nine regardless of your current seller. Next, retrieve all your workers and put them on the available worker space on your player board and retrieve your rooster from the wake up order track. Collect your residual payment next. Whichever number your wine bottle is on, take that number of coins. If it's still in the middle, you don't get anything. If you have more than seven cards in your hand, of all four types combined, then you have to discard until you only have seven. You are allowed to have more than seven during the year, but at the end of the year, you can't. Finally, rotate the grape token counterclockwise, so whoever chose their turn order last during the previous year We'll get to choose first this time. And that's it. Start over in the spring and do it all again. Keep playing and racking up the points. Something to mention about the point track is that there are ways to lose points, but they're always voluntary. You may never go lower than negative five. And even though the track stops at 25 points, you can get more than that. If anyone is at 20 points or higher at the end of the year, the game is over and whoever has the most points wins. That's about it. Sometimes after explaining the rules, I do an FAQ section to help clear up some common misconceptions or any unclear rules. However, Viticulture has a very helpful section on pages 10 and 11 of the rulebook under the title Summer and Winter Visitor Cards, which clears up a lot of the questions you might have about things like, what does this symbol mean? Or in what circumstances can I use this card, etc. There's also a glossary on the back of the rulebook and a one-page reference sheet, which are both very helpful. If you do still have a question, leave it down in the comments and I'll try to answer it the best I can. Thanks for watching.